Yeah, that would be great. Hey, everybody. <laughs> well, obviously, today's um, topic was sent out as being to talk about the Amitabha Stupa in Sedona, Arizona, which um, is arguably, but one of the most spectacular stupas that um, we have built. Um, Jetsama Akanlamo has overseen the building of uh, a number of phenomenal stupas. This one, located in Sedona, sits on a, an absolutely gorgeous piece of property that's within the city limits of Sedona itself, that's up on a hillside that overlooks the city and um, is uh, abutted by um, state I, I think it's state parks, and um, so it's absolutely pristine. And within the middle of this piece of property sits this phenomenal stupa, as you can see here. This Buddha was donated by a business in the city of Sedona. And I, Aileen, do you remember the Rinpoche that told us where to place it? Uh, one of the, I think it might have been Tukusana came along, and we had placed this Buddha someplace else. And he um, told us where to place the Buddha. And if you flip around to the other side, you will see that the stupa and that Buddha and this, which is um, said to be a naturally occurring stupa, all line up um, with each other. So we'll, we'll talk about the naturally occurring stupa later. But of all the stupas that we have, this one has naturally become a very, very powerful place of spiritual pilgrimage, both because of the combination of the fact that it's in Sedona, which is known as a sort of spiritual vortex all of its own, but also um, because of the force of um, the stupa itself. And each year, um, as the years have gone by since it was consecrated, it is um, attracting more and more and more pilgrims to the site. And so one of the ways I wanted to sort of approach talking about the stupas today was from this idea of um, need for pilgrimage. Why do we, why do we need pilgrimage? Um, seems obvious, but it's, it's kind of worth examining. And also why a stupa? You know, why, why would a stupa be appropriate place for, for pilgrimage? And I, when I was in New York I, um, on retreat, Tuku Chongchu gave a really in-depth, very detailed teaching about why it's so important when you eat to make a prayer and offer it. And um, it was astonishing. I mean, the teaching was really extensive and long. And he started talking about all the various, just not only just in the human realm, um, how many people spend all of their days searching for food, thinking about food, being hungry for food, stealing food, you know, that whole thing. But also if you switch over to the animal kingdom, you have, you know, all these different animals that, and that's all they do, is they hunt and they kill and they eat and they guard and then they do it all over again. And he said, you know, particularly in the United States, and not everyone, but by and large, we have this extraordinary blessing of walking into a grocery store and being surrounded, surrounded by um, all of this food. And it consists of animals that have lost their lives for one reason or another, or the extensive work of people growing and picking, you know, and packaging, and all of the energy that is used in transporting it, and the machines, and you know, you get the idea. It's just, just as I, we walk through, we have this extraordinary amount of work and sacrifice by so many different people and animals. And we just go through, and we pick it off, and we put it in our cart, and we go home. And he, he talked about how much, as human beings, we, why we burn merit up so quickly, is because there is so much that goes into that one little meal. And without praying and blessing and offering it, 
we have just consumed that merit and thrown it away and are moving on to the next bit of merit. And so you extrapolate into um, medicines. The medicines that we take, again, they are the work of a lot of people's scientific research, a lot of times that involve animals, and, and so it goes. And so we are constantly, constantly consuming the benefits and the work of, of those around us, even in this time. So then um, I started thinking, you know, that, that's like enormous in itself. And then when you think about taking it from just what's happening within our lives and across the broad spectrum, but you go deep historically, and um, you start thinking, I happened to pick up um, Tom Brokaw's book, The Greatest Generation, and um, just began reading it. And it talks about D-Day. And um, I don't know. I, about most people, but we probably pick our historical things that we like to learn about historically, but don't really think about the world that we live in as depending so much historically, again, on the you know, tremendous work and sacrifices of people that have come before. Whether the war, however you want to look at the conflict of it, um, he tells stories of, of situations that are are remarkable and um, bring you to tears and the fact that we don't remember and don't even care to think. Y you know, we, don't, we in, in all of our walking moments, we are not always in a point where we realize that everything that we have um, requires the effort and the sacrifice or the work or the, the intelligence of others. And these moments that we have at this time are very potent moments that depend so much on this and, and that we need to pray and offer. Now, um, the, we are aware that there is tremendous suffering. I mean, we, we look around and, you know, there have been a number of Humane Society of the United States seizures recently. Or I mean, you just pick, a, pick an area. And so from that point of view uh, and the disturbing the, the disturbing condition of the world or the problems that we perhaps are having in our own life, we understand the need for pilgrimage. But there's like a deeper need for pilgrimage, which has to do with this inability to get out of ourselves, this, we're, this inability to sort of transform from a very self-centered you know, self-absorbed view where we can only see past what's in front of us or what's comfortable um, and transform that into something much larger. We in, sort of instinctively know that we need to understand how to do this because we want to understand compassion. But we, we you know what I mean? Where there's a, like a, a, a deadness, a laziness, where it, it actually takes a lot of work to examine the world around us in that way and to sort of reach out. And in a, this is where, this is one of the purposes of a stupa. It, um, it is able to transform sort of the mundane of the world into something extraordinary. And, you know, we'll talk about exactly how it functions in a little while. But, um, the way stupas came about was there used to be naturally occurring stupas such as what this is said to be. And they actually spontaneously occurred um, um, sometimes just, so, you know, just occurred, but frequently occurred in places where somebody um, was a great practitioner or did very, very powerful practices. And um, this is in the time of Shakyamuni Buddha. Uh, one of his students, and the way that it's written, is one of his students had the merit to ask this question. And, you know, I don't, I never thought of it as somebody needs to have enough merit to ask a question. But in order, in order for this to come out of the mind of the Buddha and to be given to us the way it was given, it took an extraordinary, like, presence of mind for this student not only to think it was possible, to learn how to build something like this, 
that naturally occurs like that, but to have the devotion to think that the Buddha actually knew how to tell us how to do it. I mean, that's really, if you think about it, extraordinary. So the student asked, can you tell us how we can build, dependably build, a stupa? And so the de Buddha delivered this, um, and I don't know, it's pages and pages and books and books and books of teachings that taught specifically how to build a stupa. So what he taught was how to take what's just available to us every day, just the mundane, and turn it into something extraordinary, something um, that is said to be the presence of the enlightened mind of the Buddha. Not just symbolic of the presence of the enlightened mind of the Buddha, but the actual mind itself. Um, now, sort of each element of this, each level of the stupa, the way it's put together, and I've just figured this out recently. Um, <clears throat> there are five levels of the stupa, and I'll do it on this. This one, all the way up to there, is the first level, and that's associated with particular. Um, it's associated with a, a particular Buddha. It's associated with particular enlightened qualities, with particular poisons, and partic uh, particular element. This one is the one that has, involves the most foundational practice. It's also the biggest, you know? And I just, it just dawned on me as I was studying it for this time. As you go up to the different levels, less and less and less is said. And so there's a whole lot, you know, to talk about on this first level. The second level is this level, the third level goes up to here, the fourth is that, and the fifth is that. So, <laughs> so you know, as th there is no difference really between the, the, um, the wisdom characteristics and the poisons that are associated with them, it just seems to get subtler and subtler and subtler as you sort of move up. Now, Aileen has some footage before we talk about sort of the actual sort of, um, engine, the, the way the, the stupa functions. She has some footage about um, how, how it was built, a little bit about the outside of the construction, some about what actually goes into it. So you can see t the tremendous detail. There are only a handful of stupa builders in the world, and it takes about as eight years to learn how to build a stupa. Um, so not, not just anybody could get this handbook and follow it. There is a great deal that goes, goes into it. So we wanted to show you just a little bit about what that looks like so you can conceive. The construction of the Amitabha Stupa began in July 2003 with a small team of workers, many of whom were semi-skilled but dedicated to bringing the Amitabha Stupa into the world. Diligently, they began building the foundation and base of the Stupa, which symbolizes the ten positive actions of body, speech, and mind. They also built the three steps that represent the gateway into Buddhist practice. Work days began early and often extended into the twilight hours as the construction crew built forms cut, bent, and tied rebar, and poured and finished the cement. The project seemed to have a life of its own. Every morning we made prayers wishing that the most auspicious circumstances worked through us. Nothing about this project was ordinary. Once the foundation was completed, it was time to build the stupa's throne and the four steps. Building the rounded dome, or grumpa, on the top of the stupa's throne, perhaps the most formidable task in the entire construction process. Toku Sanyang Rinpoche asked the crew to leave an opening in the front of the bunka to serve as the access point for filling the upper chambers with weapons. This opening was later closed off to create a concave space to house the high relief of Gudami Tawa. Because the opening would destabilize the form during the concrete pour, it had to be temporarily closed off and filled with a water and sand mixture. Another challenge was to create a form for the stupid's faceplate that would frame the image of the Buddha 
and connect tightly to the Gumpa. It took more than a month to complete the clay model of the stupa's spire and to adorn it with powerful Vajraguru mantras in Sanskrit, Omahum Vajraguru Pema Sidihum. In addition, six attempts were required to sculpt on the top of the in perfect proportion before the clay image was finally cast in bronze. Yep. This one is on the, that was sort of the outside and the next one's going to be on what goes inside. <clears throat> <clears throat> While the construction crew was working on the stupa's exterior, another team was preparing the ritual offerings that would fill the inside chambers. These included tzatzas, or miniature clay statues. Making tzatzas is, is an exacting and time-intensive process. It requires adherence to a prescribed diet. No meat, no dairy, no eggs, no garlic, no onions, no alcohol, no tobacco, no sexual activity. Special prayers are recited with pure intention, setting the stage for the transformation of ordinary clay into an object of reverence. Even the breath is prevented from falling on the tzatzas while they are being made. Tzatzas are made from brass molds that are inscribed with mantra or sacred seed syllables. These mantras must be visibly imprinted on the clay for a tzatza to proceed to the next step being fired to hardness and filled with the small mantra scroll, juniper, and sacred substances. Then they are painted. Only half of the 7,000 satsas that were made were considered worthy of placement in the Amitabha Stupa. The Amitabha Stupa is filled with close to a billion sacred mantras or prayers. Traditionally, these mantras were handwritten, purified with saffron-infused water, and rolled by hand around sticks of incense. Although hundreds of the smaller rolls were completed in the ancient way, Western ingenuity made it possible to accomplish the mantra printing and rolling on a roll-to-roll -roll printing press. Even saffron water was placed in one of its ink reservoirs, misting the paper as it passed through the press. The result? Uniform, tightly bound rolls of tiny legible mantras, well over a million on each roll. Once delivered to the KPC temple, the mantra rolls were covered with fine cloth and ribbons in the five auspicious colors of blue, white, red, green, and yellow. Then they were blessed in an elaborate ceremony and placed in every stupa chamber. Every stage of stupa building involves extensive ceremonial preparation. Tuku Sanyang Rinpoche, one of the foremost stupa masters in the world, visited throughout the year to guide the Amitabha stupa builders and to perform the traditional rituals. Some of these were performed at the KPC temple and were quite elaborate, taking many hours and sometimes days to complete. On one occasion, Rinpoche conducted extensive prayers to bless the offerings for the stupas in our chambers. These included a colorful three-dimensional mandala constructed as an antidote to poverty and offered to them. These included a colorful three-dimensional mandala constructed as an antidote to poverty and offered to Zambala, the Buddhist deity that symbolizes inner and outer wealth. The Buddhist deity that symbolizes inner and outer wealth. <laughs> Symbolic offering. The Amitabha Stupa is filled in stages with many types of carefully prepared and consecrated offerings. The vast and deep hollow throne chamber was reached by ladder and heavier offerings were lowered down by a pulley system. In addition to sacred and ritual substances, offerings included aromatic cedar and everyday objects. For example, buckets of grains, rakes and shovels were offered to antidote hunger and famine. And homeopathic medicines were included to promote health and healing. Water, rocks, and earth from every continent, and meteorites from space extend the stupa's blessing throughout earth and sky. Okay.
ਕਰਦੇ ਹੋ ਹੋਰ ਥੈਂਕ ਯੂ ਇਹਨੇ such a great smile <laughs> <laughs> one of the reasons i was talking about sort of the <coughs> presence of, with knowing what's going on with us at this time and also with history is because you know those are kind of mundane sort of circumstances that i was talking about um but if we think of it in terms of our teachers our teacher now and the depths of the teachings and sacrifices that have gone into making something like this stupa available um making this path available um that is a whole another level of you know sort of lack of presence of mind lack of gratitude you know lack of awareness that dullness again that we we sort of struggle against and um i sort of looked up who who is amitabha you know i was thought amitabha was a, a a buddha and amitabha is a buddha but not always um apparently um before the buddha of this it's not an eon what is it whatever the buddha of this time under the previous previous buddha under that period of time amitabha became amitabha was born as a monk and um through millions of years of effort eons of effort um his path consisted of accomplishing and you know it'll make you cry if you really read these teachings his path was to accomplish the ability that when he became enlightened he would establish a pure realm where if anybody just thought of him or caused his called his name they would be able to be be reborn in amitabha's pure realm that's one of the reasons it took him so long um i have i brought this and if you don't mind i'll read it to you if i can find it it was uh, i don't have it i didn't bring it in but it it is um a description of the it's a beautifully written description of his the vast the vastness of his compassion was such that he could not stop or achieve enlightenment or become a buddha until this was accomplished for all sentient beings and his color is red because it because it is the radiating color of um compassionate limitless compassion um the reason why i bring this up is because this is an amitabha stupa amitabha is associated with the third the the third level of the stupa that we're going to talk about right in here um but when we go around the stupa and it's this amitabha stupa i mean i don't think i ever thought about the sheer f- force of the practice of the the buddha that 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 stupa who's in that stupa whose statue is in that stupa whose enlightened mind is in that stupa that the sheer force of a a practice over millions and millions and millions of years with that simple intention um that's astonishing that we have access to that or that we can support that or or be a part of that it just the power of that is just mind blowing to me um there are some um really really interesting teachings on the internet about Am- Amitabha Buddha that um I'm sorry I didn't bring it but if you look at look it up and sort of scroll through so some of them are a little deeper down and uh, you can read the story of of what what all he did over such a long period of time in the depth of his compassion and depth of his wishing prayers so um that's history. <laughs> I mean that's like whoa. So anyway, I I wanted to remember not to forget to say that. So anyway, the um the way the the stupa is built um again, the whole idea that we need to have pilgrimage and then we sort of innately know that we need to learn these things. It it is built to offer balance to the elements so it benefits any community that it's in. um earth wind water air fire 
Um, it, it, it is built to bring all those elements into harmony. It's built to bring the elements within your psyche um, and all of your poisons. It's built to antidote the poisons. It's constructed very, very specifically with the, the way these prayers are put in there and the way the offerings are put in there, the, the length of the steps, the angle, the direction that the stupa faces, all of it has a, an intention and a purpose that is um, instructed from the enlightened mind. So this, this first really big level, you know, that seems so long, is um, the element that it's related to is the earth. And um, the, the idea with the earth is that we are all made of the same clay, that we, we all come from the earth and we all return to the earth, and that no matter what our particular mental capacities are, social capacities, wealth, whatever, same. And it's also a uh, part that we sort of forget, it's also related to incredible beauty. That the earth left to its own devices is, is flourishes and abundant and is quite beautiful in all that it has to offer. The, the poison, the root poison, and all the poisons in this, in, in essence are the same, but we'll, we'll, there's one specifically associated to this level, and that's the poison of pride. And um, and the reason the the way it's talked about is because pride kind of has a lot of insecurities. When you have pride, you have the insecurities that are associated with it. And so w w with that, you have kind of a self-absorption, and um, you'll get all the things that come with self-absorption: lack, I don't have enough, you know, wanting more. Um, or needing to get more. Um, I always joke about hoarding, but it is, it is um, associated with this whole level of either pulling things towards you or um, um, not feeling beautiful enough, not, not whatever it is, you just don't have enough. And um, sort of wanting what other people have and things like that. And the antidote to that, um, the sort of enlightened quality that is associated with this level of the stupa is limitless generosity. And it makes sense because self-absorption is all about pulling to the self, you know, worrying about the self, getting depressed about the self. And limitless generosity pushes outward. So you can't kind of be limitlessly generous and pulling things towards yourself. They, they work against each other. and so. It functions as the transformative wisdom of, of um, this this level of the stupa, um, and the, the the example that is frequently given about it is that um, it has the quality of the sun, and the, thus the color yellow is associated with this level of the stupa, in that it just radiates indiscriminately on all those around it. <clears throat> so. Um, it, it's working towards seeing all sentient beings as the same. It's, a, it's like the ultimate goal is the end. You know, when you get really up to the top where it's the enlightened mind, then there is no self and other. Well, this is, this is this long series on the path, and each one of these steps um, symbolizes a level, and I've never actually learned all the different 13s of this and levels of the path that are associated with all of that. But... Um, that is, this is the beginning of it, sort of the, the, the practice of limitless generosity. So, and then um, we move on to another element, which is the element of water, if I've got this right. Yay. Uh, um, and that would be related to this level here. And again, you, look, you think of the qualities of water, there are, there are two. One is it reflects whatever Whatever shines, shines in the water, it reflects it back. It doesn't take a little of this and combine it and make a different face. It's just, that's it. It just reflects back. And it also flows. Where, however it needs to shape or whatever, it reflects and it just flows as things go. And um, the particular poison associated with this level of the stupa is hatred. And, um, and Hatred just naturally, of course, includes anger, and you know it gets tricky. I mean, in our own minds, because we 
like to really think that there is anger that is okay. You know, there are certain circumstances where it, it's um, you can sort of defend. You know, why you're so pissed off. So, you know, but when you talk about the practice on this level, they talk about hatred as having a, a very laser-like, pristine clarity to the energy that focuses it. So there's a lot of energy that comes into your mind and it has a target and it's, it's just very, very clear in, in how it's directing itself and how it's, it's um, it, what, it, what it wants to have happen. You know, just the, the, the force of it. It has a destructive force, it has a, um, a confrontational force. There's just a lot of energy behind it. And so the, um, I always thought that the, the quality that would be, deal with hatred would be compassion, but it's wisdom. It's imperturbable wisdom. And if you think about it, the way it works is that, the way it was taught, is that all that energy that goes into that laser-like focus that you bring up and force of that, you take that energy and you realize the true enemy, which is ignorance and suffering. So you get this, this understanding that there is no enemy there. There is no object of your hatred. The, the enemy is your ignorance, that you don't know that. And then you take this, this, clear, this energy, this force that you have, and you, you use it for um, good instead of evil. You, know? you, you use it for your, your path. And you, I mean, I joke, but well, I mean, we know that. We know how much energy there is in being angry. And if you have the spaciousness in mind, this gift, this, you know, this ability to like, think, wait a minute, and understand and get a little bit of wisdom and redirect it, it's um, powerful. And you know, that is the, the gift and the offering of that, that particular, you know, it's hard, but that particular level of the stupa. It can, it can transmute hatred into, you know, something completely different, something extraordinary, something that leads to enlightenment, and and that's its function. That's how. That's what it naturally does. Um, so, I think I think that about covers that. Then, as we move up, we get to fire, and to that this level right here that is associated with fire. And that's the element of, of earth. And they talk about fire as just consuming everything and leaving nothing but space. Um, it's, it can also offer warmth and comfort, but as, as it functions as an element, that's, that's what it's supposed to do. And the the poison that is associated with it um, is passion, in that we, and again, these, none of these are separate from the other. They're all sort of the same, but they offer a, a different ways of looking at our own poisons and our own enlightenment. So it's different Buddhas, different methods, different paths. But this is the level that Amitabha Buddha is associated with, the level of fire. That's the color red that is associated with him and also with the level of the stupa. And it is this, um, this ability to overcome anything that has to do with self. Passion has to do with pulling things, again, it's uh, pulling things to the self, focusing on something, having something, having great energy you know, for whatever the object of our desire happens to be. And the antidote here is this um, infinite compassion, infinite light. And um, when, as I told you before about Amitabha Buddha and the practices that he did for all sentient beings so that when he became, he, he, would, he would establish a pure land like that, um, that is the transformative, transformative power that is imbued in that stupa and that is available to us Again, just naturally, that's just what it does. Um, so as you can see, you know, when we do the earth level, well, there's 
things that uh, there's so much and as we get up it gets a little bit more subtle um, and more extraordinary it's like more subtle but extraordinary in that it applies to uh, an entire pure land and all sentient beings and the virtue of practice that went behind all of that and then when we um, go up one more level forget there's two more one is wind um, this this is oh, this level right up here um, this one, I, it's, it's hard to, um, you know, I have to rethink it, rethink it, rethink it, because wind is, is um, an element that um, is energy without any restrictions. It's just energy that flows wherever it needs to flow at any time that it needs to go there. And they say that this particular level of the stupa and this particular element are related to the deepest, deepest part of the human psyche. And the, um, the poison that's associated with it is envy, um, which seems to, again, include all these other poisons that we're talking about, anger, pride, you know, all this kind of stuff. They're all overlapping. But the, um, the, um, the antidote is equanimity. And you know, if you think about it, if we were to be able to get in touch with the deepest part of our psyche, which would be our enlightened self, so that the, the, the I guess it's the secret inner and outer or something like that, but anyway, the, our enlightened self, our activities, our energies, wherever we went, would be in perfect harmony. So it's equanimity perfect harmony that even though it um, was energy without direction, energy going in all directions wherever it was needed, if it was in tune with the enlightened mind of our own nature, it would be harmonious. Does that make sense? Yeah, and then it doesn't anymore. <laughs> and then you got to think about it all over again. Um, it, so it, it gets like more mysterious that the um, I, you know, I'll hear a lot of people saying they, they hate it when it's really, really windy, really stormy. There is something about wind. Um, horses get really spooky in the wind. It's, you know, it, it's, a, it's a, just a sort of an interesting element to contemplate and that the, that the antidote to all of that would be sort of this inner wisdom, this sort of, you know, enlightened mind where all actions, no matter how they look, just were exactly as they were supposed to be. It would all be harmonious. Um, they talks about there's a fearlessness that comes from this. All opposites unite. It's like this, in, within this wisdom and release is this unification and coming together. It's uh, kind of mystical. <laughs> um, and the color associated with that level of the stupa is, the, is green you know, the color of sort of peace and tranquility. And then you get to the top level, which is the, you know, the level of space, um, of clear light, um, you know, the level of no discrimination, um, no, no self, self, no other, you know, nothing. But um, that it's important to remember that within this clear light, and we've talked about this before, where you have light and you put a prism and you see the five colors. So um, on this side, there's nothing. You have a prism. You have something. You go back to this, and you have nothing. And so it's really important to remember that within this is all of that, and all of this is still this. Um, same with the stupa. It's, um, it is kind of, within the stupa is the clear mind of enlightenment and yet it comes out and takes this form that we see and that radiates out these um, wisdom qualities of the Buddha, the limitless com compassion, the ec total equanimity, all of those qualities you know, are radiating out from this enlightened mind. Now, lamas have taken a lot of trouble for millions of years, I guess, time out of mind, building stupas, and the reason is us. The reason is, you know, harmony. The reason, it, it's a gift that they give over and over and over again 
to help us antidote these poisons that are not particular to us in this time, but that apparently, you know, as somebody said, people have been moody for a long, long time. So, you know, <laughs> um, this, this particular stupa right now, um, we are in a, and then this is not a fundraising talk, it's just to say that I was thinking, wouldn't it be cool if I wrote a book, maybe it would last a couple, you know, couple, maybe a generation or something like that. And then I thought, wow, this is built to last over a thousand years. So if you can be part of or have an opportunity to contribute to or build or protect or do anything regarding something like this, you know, what, how amazing, how many people have that opportunity? And we do. So um, this stupa, we're in the last month of a fundraising drive to um, try to secure the stupa and the land around it. Um, and so we're encouraging people to, to make an offering in whatever way they can. Annie Aileen told me it's a 10,000 day. <laughs> so your merit is multiplied by 10,000 times. Um, there are many ways you can donate. Um, and if you want to make an offering, you're welcome to talk to me. Um, there's a website online where you can become a friend of the Amitabha Stupa, meaning that you can make a donation every month. It can be five dollars. Um, it makes so much difference right now because even if it is five dollars a month, when we sit down and talk to the people that are involved in the Stupa project who hold the, the mortgage on this land, they're wonderful people. But to be able to sit down and say there are 1,000 people a month that, that donate to this Stupa, or to be able to tell them the numbers of dollars that are in the donation box and say, in this week, you know, we have $600, $1 bills probably. That means so many people, that makes a difference. That really shows that that stupa is supported and loved and, and a very, very powerful place of pilgrimage, which is how we started talking about this in the first place. So I think that's all I had to say. Are there any questions? Sure. I'm not necessarily answering it. Is the passion one the desire realm? Um, well, I couldn't hear that in there. So I... No, I wasn't talking about realms. Um, I was talking about poisons. And, you well, know, desire so, is a poison. Right. And, and um, you know, desire could be in any of them. Um, envy this desire, passion, this desire, um, self-absorption, you know, <laughs> we're pulling things to us, hoarding. So um, isn't desire like, you know, one of the basic? The cause of suffering. The cause of suffering, there it is. So, um, but I was, you know, I try to sort of stick with what, you know, I've been reading and studying and, and we weren't talking about realms, so. There you go. So we'll just say Jetsama's um, dedication prayer. It's on page 56. <clears throat> By this effort, may all sentient beings be free of suffering. May their minds be filled with the nectar of virtue. May all causes resulting in suffering be extinguished, and only the light of compassion shine throughout all realms. Thank you very much, Claire. This is an excellent presentation. <laughs>